But today we're talking about the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh. I'm not going to spend as much time on each one because there's a lot more works of the flesh. There's 17 of them. We went through the nine fruit of the Spirit last week. But today we're talking about the works of the flesh. So like last week's sermon was a reminder of some of the characteristics that as Christians we should strive to do, today is a reminder of some of the characteristics as a Christian we should strive not to do. And we should strive not to do. Galatians 5. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. So you can see here in Galatians 5 that this is not an exhaustive list. And same with the fruit of the Spirit. Like the fruit of the Spirit, there's nine, but that's not all there is, I believe, because it says against such there is no law, right? So I think there are more than just nine attributes of the fruit of the Spirit. And likewise, even though 17 works of the flesh, sinful works of the flesh are mentioned here, this is not an exhaustive list, right? Because it says, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So Galatians 5 is not an exhaustive list, and it's works of the flesh. And if you know Galatians 5, it talks about this struggle between the spirit and the flesh. So this list here in Galatians 5, this is something that every Christian is capable of. Every Christian is capable of doing the things in this list. Now, does it mean that everything in this list is done by every single Christian? No. But what, what you need to understand is because there are these things we are capable of, and it is a battle not to do these things. And in fact, if we do not walk in the Spirit, we will tend to do these things. Right? We will do the works of the flesh. We don't want to get this attitude where people say, how can you be a Christian and do X, Y, Z? How many times have you heard somebody say that? They're a Christian and I can't believe they do this. Or you call yourself a Christian, how can you do this? How can we be, sa- how can we be Christians? How can we be saved and do these things? Well, it's very possible, isn't it? Because it's possible for all of us to walk in the flesh you know, we have to walk in the Spirit so that we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So this idea that Christians are incapable of doing these things, or if you do any of the things on this list, that somehow makes you not saved, then who is saved? Right? Because this is just talking about sins, right, in general. And now there are some specific ones on there. Now where people get a bit caught up with this, uh, this idea of, oh, well, you can't do these things and still go to heaven, is this passage here, right? When it says here, the which I tell you before, and I've also told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And people misunderstand this passage, right? And they say here, see, if you do these things, you're not going to go to heaven. Well, let me ask you, if you think this is what this verse is teaching, I mean, do we believe in a work salvation? I mean, do you think you have to work your way to heaven? Do you think you have to give up all your sins and turn away from all your sins in order to be saved? I mean, if you had to do that, who could be saved? I said, this is obviously not teaching that in order to be saved, you need to stop sinning. So what is it talking about? It's talking about people that do these things, or these things, right? People that do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, how does that make sense in light of salvation? Well, why do we sin? Right? Well, this passage actually tells us why, right? Because we have the spirit and the flesh. Now, when you die and you go to heaven, does your flesh go with you? No, it doesn't, right? Your flesh is on the ground. It's going to get buried. That's what causes you to sin. Now, when you're saved, you have a new spirit, right? Your spirit and your soul go on to be with God. So is your flesh going to inherit the kingdom of God? No. But this is why you sin, and that's why that's who's doing it, right? The sin, like... Like Paul said, it's no longer I that do it, that, that sin that dwelleth in me. So one day, that body will be made new. It will be made sinless. So you see how these sins will never inherit the kingdom of God. The flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. But that's not what's going to heaven. What's going to heaven when you're saved is your soul and your spirit. See, your spirit cannot sin. It is born of God. And it's that creature 
that is going to heaven. Not the old man. See, the old you will not go to heaven. But you need to understand that being a saved person living right now, you have to live with both natures. And that's why there's a struggle. And this is why you don't want to get caught up in this whole, if you're a Christian, if you're saved, you won't do these things because we will never be rid of the flesh until uh, you know, we see Jesus, right? Or, or if we go to heaven and we shed the flesh uh, as we die in this life. So once we shed the flesh, we'll be in heaven, but our sinful flesh does not inherit the kingdom of God, and that's who won't. Right? So you say, do I still sin? Yes, as a whole. But the new man, the new victor, the new creature cannot sin because it's born of God. But when you look at me as a whole, I still sin. So what I want you to reflect on today, so we're going to be talking about, we're not so much talking about what happens when you get saved. We're going to be talking about each of these individual ones. I want to just spend a few minutes on each one and give you a few thoughts. Not only define, if you don't know what they all are, today you'll learn about what they all are, but what I wanted you to reflect on today is you know, how much are you seeing these works in your life? So last week we reflected on how much of the fruit of the Spirit are we seeing in our life. Hey, how can we have more fruit of the Spirit in our life? This is the opposite now. How much are you seeing in this, of this in your life? And how can you have less of these works of the flesh in your life? What can you do to see less of it. And you know, really the trick to overcoming sin is not just the willpower to stop doing it. Do you know what I mean? So some people think, well, if I'm just sin, if I'm just strong enough mentally, spiritual, I'll just refrain from doing it. You know, just the willpower to not do it. But no, the better way to overcome bad habits, to overcome sin, is to replace it with good habits. So you don't just stop sinning, right? You walk in the Spirit, right? You walk in the Spirit, you replace bad habits, you replace sins with good things to do, right? That's the better way to overcome it, right? So, like, for example, if you're lazy, right? You should start putting things into your schedule. Start committing to things, right? To stop yourself from being lazy. You don't just say to yourself, I'm not going to be lazy anymore, right? So don't just focus on the bad, Right? You need to stop bad behavior, stop sinful behavior by replacing it with good. And we'll, and we'll talk about that as we go through some of these. Now the first two I'm just going to hit at the same time. Right? Adultery and fornication. Adultery and fornication. Now some people think that these are completely separate things. Right? They'll define well, adultery is when you're married, and then you sleep with somebody you're not married to. And then fornication is like unmarried people sleeping together, right? But really, the way we need to understand it is, and if you understand it this way, then a lot of passages in the Bible will make more sense, is fornication, adultery, or fornication is the broader category, even though its, its primary use is to differentiate fornication that is not adultery. Right, so adultery is when you're married, you sleep with somebody else. Fornication, people generally think, is unmarried people sleeping together. But what you need to know is adultery is a type of fornication. But when adultery and fornication are used together, it's to differentiate between married people who sleep with people they're not married to and unmarried people because adultery is a much more serious form of fornication. Right? Just like homosexuality and bestiality are much more serious forms of fornication than just unmarried people sleeping together, even though that is a sin as well. Right? And we know one is worse than the other because of the criminal, the way the justice system deals with this. Right? Because in God's justice system, adultery, homosexuality, bestiality are capital punishment crimes. But fornication, is a, there's a way where if they fornicate, then they're forced to marry or they have to pay a dowry or a fine or things like that. So one is more serious than the other. Now how do we know that fornication is a, a wider category, or adultery is a subset of fornication? Well, look at Matthew 19, where Jesus talks about marriage. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, two, 
but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So I think it's, it's very important there that, you know, we have in our day and age today all sorts of reasons why people can get divorced, right? Just irreconcilable differences. Right now, it's just like fault, you can, whatever. You can just get divorced for any reason you want. You just sign on the dotted line and the government gets, lets you get divorced. But you know what you need to understand is even though the government may think you're divorced, God still sees you as married, right? So here it says here, what God hath joined together, let not, let not man put asunder. But there is one exception, right? There's one exception that's allowed. Verse 7, they say unto him, why did Moses then get, command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? So they're saying, well, if the intention of God was then to stay together always, why is there this bill of divorcement in the Old Testament law? And that's in Deuteronomy 24, if you want to go back and read it in your own time. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. And the way I understand this is because God... You know, obviously the intention was that people don't sin, right? They don't commit adultery and fornication after they're married. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. So there is one exception. It's an unfortunate one. It happens. But, you know, sometimes, you know, when people have children, even though sometimes adultery takes place, it may be more expedient. For the couple to stay together but uh you know you know this is unfortunate right and this is why the hardness of people's hearts when they sin you know and this sermon is not all about this but you can go back and listen to my some of my sermons on marriage and fornication but there is one exception but you'll see here if people depart from one another except for this cause of fornication why are they committing adultery if they marry another person well, it's because they're still married Right? Just because the government says you're not married, that doesn't change whether you're married in the eyes of God and whether you are committing sin by marrying another person uh, whilst you are still married. Right? Now, Jesus says here, except for fornication. Now, in Jeremiah 3, we see here the analogy of God using this analogy of marriage and likening it to him divorcing Israel because of idolatry. Right? Idolatry is being likened here to the, uh, the adultery that is being that is taking place spiritually with God. Jeremiah 3 says here in verse 8, And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. So the harlot, harlot obviously is a prostitute, for somebody that just sleeps, for some, sleeps with somebody just for money. And um, the Bible does talk about you know, people that just you know, commit fornication uh, you know, without actually being paid, right? Like a prostitute. And they're actually worse than a harlot, right? Because they're not even getting paid for it. That's what the, um, the God thinks about fornication. But here, you can see here that the exception in Matthew 19 was except for fornication. And you can see here that it includes adultery. So you see how adultery is included in the grander scheme of fornication. Um, it's, it's a subset. 1 Corinthians 5, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. So you see here that this guy was committing adultery with his father's wife. I mean, you'd hope it's not actually his mum, right? But, you know, you'd think that his father has like another wife, but then he's sleeping with his father's wife. And here it's saying here that this sort of fornication... Is, is, is not even so much named among the Gentiles. So you can see here that our world has definitely gotten a lot worse, whereas he's saying here, this sort of fornication, not even the Gentiles dare to commit, and yet it's happening in the Corinthian church here, and how times have changed, where today, I mean, just fornication is rampant. This is just normal part of life, and that, is not, that should not be the case amongst God's people. You know, fornication and adultery should be something that is frowned upon, that is, you know, it should be a glorified that people go to their, to their marriage altar uh, pure, right? But generally nowadays, m very few people are pure. But this should be something that is normal amongst God's people. Now, what's the, the sort of attitude we should have when it comes to fornication and adultery? So I'm not just talking about only fornication. I'm talking, about, I'm talking to you married men as well, right? This is the sort of attitude you need to have when it comes to this temptation of fornication 
and adultery, ladies as well. How much adultery happens in the workplace where people are just you know, spending too much time with people that are not their spouse and you, know, you have problems with your spouse and that, that person just understands you so well, don't they? Yeah, it's because they're not married to you yet, right? First Corinthians 6.15, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? As we read this morning. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. Right? So he's saying, you know, the two shall be one flesh is what he's talking about here. It's like, it's like how dare you take, you know, your body, right, which is, you know, belongs to God and then join it to a prostitute. God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body. For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Verse 18, this is where I want you to focus on. Flee fornication. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. See, that's the sort of attitude we need to have with fornication is that we run from it. We don't see how close we can get to it and then try and resist. We want to have the attitude of like not even putting ourselves in the situation to begin with. And this is how a lot of fornication and adultery happens is that people aren't wise about the situations they put themselves in. And then before you know it, well, I couldn't help myself. I was in this, it's in a weak moment. Well, we need to be a bit wiser than that. Put ourselves, do not put ourselves in situations where it'll cause ourselves to sin. I don't know if you heard of the story recently, and unfortunately a lot of people think that it actually happened um, because a lot of witnesses have come out and it's unfortunate that the man has passed away. But I don't know if you heard about the situation with Ravi Zacharias. Ravi Zacharias, a lot of people think that you know, all the stuff that he's being accused of, it did actually happen, right? Because there's a lot of witnesses coming out and all the corroboration and whatnot. And um, uh, David Wood did a good piece on it, if you listen to his stuff as well. David Wood sort of covered it, talked over some of the evidence and whatnot. But you know, I'm not here to say whether it happened or not. But the point I'm trying to bring up is, you know, it's just unfortunate that this is happening too often with men of God, right? And it doesn't change some of the, the work that he's done. I'm sure he's done a lot of great work, but it just goes to show that the, the, the best of men are men at best. But what is the problem here? You know, I, the thing is, you know, people are saying, oh, you know, how hold him accountable and all that sort of stuff. And I'm all for that, right? Like people need to realize when they're slipping and, be, you know, have a circle of accountability. But one of the problems I find with these big name preachers, any big name preacher that ends up falling into adultery or fornication is a problem with the method. You know, what's the problem with the method? It's this traveling around months and months away from home, away from your family, away from your wife, going from hotel to hotel to hotel, preaching here, preaching there. I mean, what do you expect? Now, this is what happens with preachers and missionaries and any sort of speaker. They spend so much time away that they don't even think, like, you know, then they find themselves in a hotel and then they go sleep with a prostitute. Or, or other things where they're, like, counselling young girls. You know, counselling young girls, counselling, going to their house, getting coming out in their office, right? I mean, we need to have some wisdom as older men or just as older men, not even to put ourselves in that situation. To find a problem with the system, it's not, hey, well, uh, you know, well I'm going to do it. I'm going to do what they do, but I'm going to resist. Right? It's like what people say about King Solomon. Yeah, well, if I had all the money, I could handle it. You know, if I had all the power and all the riches. Don't kid yourself. Right? That's why it's better just to like, not even put yourself in that situation. So likewise with adultery, you know, we need to have this attitude of fleeing from it. It's the same with pornography. Right? Pornography is a big problem today, right? And nowadays, you can just get it whenever you want, right? Just log on. There's all sorts of websites. You can get it on your phone, see? So it's the same thing. How do you overcome a problem with pornography? Well, you need to replace it with good habits. Don't put yourself in that situation, right? Don't be in situations where you're alone all the time. You know, with your, it's a bit hard now with your phone, but say with like with the computer in the house, right? If you're living in a house and you've got a computer in your room, you have too much private time in your room, then maybe you shouldn't have a computer in your room. Maybe you should put it in the living room somewhere, so it's somewhere where there's accountability, people know what you're doing on the computer. But pornography is a big deal and it's a big issue, right? It's a big problem that a lot of people struggle with. And it's often something that doesn't get talked about a lot, 
but it's obvious that it's wrong. Right? So how do we overcome these sins? Well, this is why marriage exists. Right? Marriage exists in order to fulfill those sexual desires that we naturally have as human beings. But we need to make sure we flee from fornication, that we don't put ourselves in these situations. And we find, if we find ourselves like David, King David, with too much idle time, then we need to get our lives a bit more busy. Right? If we're more busy with things, then we'll have less time to be idle and get ourselves into trouble. So not only the physical, right, but even the looking. Matthew 5, 28, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. All right, so that's adultery and fornication. Uncleanness. Uncleanness. Now, oftentimes when people think about uncleanness, they only think about sexual uncleanness. But no. We already talked about sexual uncleanness, adultery, fornication. Uncleanness can also just talk about your general hygiene and tidiness. Your general hygiene and tidiness. You say, like, well, I don't fornicate. I don't, uh, you know, I'm not committing adultery. But you, does you, is your house a pigsty? You know, do you take care of yourself? Are you washing up? You know, sometimes you need to take some time to clean up your house. Right? That's why sometimes it's good to have a wife in the home. People will say, you know, what do housewives do all day at home? Well, there's plenty of cleaning to do at home. I'll tell you what. People that their wife goes out and works and does everything other than keeping the home, their house starts going to, to mess, right? Because it's not just making sure the table's cleared so you can eat dinner. It's also like cleaning the bathroom and dusting down and all the other stuff, you know, that, that, that all the other mess that goes on. Even keeping track of the garden, you know, like that's hard. That's hard enough to keep track of as well. So there's plenty of things to do around the house. So being a keeper of the home, I mean, that's a full-time job, especially when you've got kids. So uncleanness. Look at what it says here. Maybe you've never heard this verse in the Bible, but you'll hear it this morning. Deuteronomy 23, verse 12. Thou shalt have a place also without the camp, whither thou shalt go forth abroad, and thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapons. Well, a paddle, it's like a shovel, right, on your weapon. And thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon, it shall be when thou, shalt, when thou wilt ease thyself abroad. Thou shalt dig therewith, and shalt turn back and cover that which cometh from thee. See, the Bible has some wisdom that some cultures don't follow. You know, you some, go to some cultures and they're just like peeing in the streets and you're throwing their trash, you know, their human excrement out the window. I mean, God has some wisdom here to say, hey, you know, when you ease yourself, go out of the camp, you know, like we would normally, sometimes you might do if you're camping and there's no toilets there, you go away, you dig a hole, you do your business, and then you cover it, right? But you see here that God is a God of cleanliness. He didn't want just somebody just digging a hole right outside their tent and it's in the mix, midst of the camp. He's saying if you have the bathrooms should be away from the camp. Right? So this is the idea of hygiene in the Bible and cleanliness. Right? So uncleanness can just be talking about just being tidy and, and hygienic because if you're not hygienic, it can lead to sickness and disease. Right? It can lead to problems. And we see here even leprosy in the Bible. It's something that was contagious. It kind of spread. And things, you know, if somebody died in a house, you see in the Bible, even the uncovered vessels that were in the house were now unclean. So you can see here that God is teaching people about this, this micro world that exists that gets people sick and, and spreads illness and disease. Now, if you didn't know, God required man to be clean to enter his temple back in the Old Testament. That's why he had clean and unclean laws. And as we read in 1 Corinthians 6, remember our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Right? Should not we treat our temple like God expected his physical temple to be treated? To be clean. Right? So you need to make time for cleaning around the house. I know we're all busy, but that's one thing we got to do. Right? We need to make sure that where we live is clean because we want also our children to have clean habits as well. Why, why nowadays you see some cultures, they're just a mess. You know, just, it's okay to spit on the floor, throw rubbish into the, when you go to the beach, you, know, you leave the beach, you leave all your rubbish there. Or, you know, just these, these, these habits of uncleanness. We don't want to perpetuate this into the next generation. We want our children to have good habits as well of cleanliness, right, and tidiness. So it's just general things, you know, just wa you know washing your clothes with warm water. <laughs> I don't even know that. 
everyone's into the cold wash these, these days, but then if you wash your clothes only with cold water, you're not actually rinsing out a lot of the stuff. I, I, I would recommend, if you're still using a top load dishwash, uh, top load washing machine, get yourself a front loader, right? Because those top loaders, they just like build mold and just like, you know, they're just sort of jiggling in this big vat of, uh, you know, moldy, soapy stuff. But get yourself those front loaders. They actually clean your clothes properly. They're just those sort of things. Washing your clothes. Rinsing, brushing, flush, flossing your teeth. I don't think that's too much of a problem in this church, but you know, I'm sure you've spoken to the individual every now and then, and you try and take a few steps back when, when they talk, right? So oral hygiene. I mean, your, your mouth is like a good indicator of how healthy your body is. I don't even know that. So the things you eat and just taking care of yourself. If you have bad breath, right, it's an indication that you're not healthy inside. But also sometimes people just have bad breath because they're not flossing. They're not brushing their teeth properly. It's just like good hygiene. And it's very important that your mouth is clean. And this sermon is not all about health habits, but I just want to just say some pretty obvious ones. But there's also bad habits. Like a lot of people smoke. Right? Smoking is a very unclean thing as well. It stinks, it stains your body, stains your fingers, and things like that. So sometimes bad habits can lead to uncleanliness as well. So, all right? so we need to eat well, take care of our bodies, drink plenty of water. All right, let's go on to number four. So that was uh, number three, uncleanness. Number four is lasciviousness. Now, what is lasciviousness? If you're not familiar with your Bible, you might think, I've never heard of this word in my life. Lasciviousness. How many syllables is that? Lasciviousness. Five syllables. So what, is, what does lasciviousness mean? Lascivious, lasciviousness is when you are just like, it's just like unrestrained indulgence in fleshly lusts. That's what it is. It's just like, and that can include, obviously, fornication. It can include drugs. But it's just like, it's just a life that's just lived for pleasure. Right? Just like, if you think of like hedonism. So you can also think of it like excessive holidays. You know, some people, they just come back from a holiday and want to go on a holiday again. Just like want a holiday all the time. Just about like, just, just, their life is just about just making themselves feel pleasure as opposed to a life about work. So not only is it just pleasures of this life, I mean, drug use would be like, like lasciviousness, just this desire to constantly feel good and just feeding the pleasure. But what about food? Oh, just like, you know, food and just gluttony. Right? That sort of lasciviousness in food can just lead to obesity, right? Which people just eating too much can just taste so good, right? And just feeding their fleshly desires. So this is lasciviousness, right? This is something of the flesh. First Peter 4, for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For thee he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. For he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of of men, but to the will of God. So like walking in the Spirit is the opposite of walking in the flesh. Well, what's the opposite of indulging oneself and serving yourself? It's serving God. Right? So the more you serve God, the less you're going to serve yourself. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, look what it's grouped with, lust, excess of wine, revelings, I'm going to talk about that one a bit later, but uh, it's very similar to lasciviousness, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatry. So we see here lasciviousness, just unrestrained, indulging in fleshly lusts. We talked about a few examples. How do we overcome this? Well, the, the solution to every one of our sins is to walk in the Spirit, but more specifically, hey, how do we overcome this self-serving of ourselves or well, fill your life with more serving others. Fill your life with more serving God and you'll have less time at least to serve others and as you grow in, serve yourself and as you, as you serve others and you serve the Lord Jesus Christ, then hopefully that spirit in you will grow as you feed the spirit more than the flesh. So get busy serving the Lord. You know, find joy and fulfillment in ministry, right? Rather than pleasure. You know, we are not on this earth to only enjoy life. Right, we are here to work. So remember that, guys. Remember that we are not only here to just enjoy life. Just think about that for a moment. Are you living your life in a way where you're just doing it just to enjoy life? No, we're here to serve God. We're here to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Idolatry. Idolatry. Exodus 20. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the, the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me keep my commandments. Now probably amongst the group of people here idolatry may not be a, such a big deal. I can't imagine anyone in this room bowing down to a statue, but if you are, that's what it's talking about. <laughs> bowing down to a statue, worshipping it. But don't get caught up in idolatry. You might have a lucky charm. You know, you're like, you, have, you know, I wear this because it brings me luck. I mean, that is a form of idolatry too. Like, why, why are you trusting something that you made or something you bought from some voodoo shop thinking that it's going to give you, you know, good luck? Like, you know, if people carry like a rabbit's paw. Some people start thinking they wear a cross and they start making the cross into an idol, right? And they start thinking, this cross, I've got to wear this, give me luck. And you know, that's why you're starting to tread into idolatry situations, right? Now, idolatry, just to clear up, is not just the making of something. So it's not like the Jehovah's Witnesses say where it's like just having a cross is idolatry and paganism and whatnot. There's nothing wrong with making a statue of something. Right? There's nothing wrong with having a statue of, a, of, a, of an animal in your house. You, know, you may have like statues of animals just for decorations and whatnot. That's not the problem. The problem is when you bow down and serve them. Why is that? Because there are times in the Bible where people has, have made brazen things. Look here in Numbers 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent. So who got Moses to do this? God. And set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if the serpent had bitten any man, that he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So if you don't know the story in Numbers 21, the people of Israel are complaining. So God judges them. He sends fiery serpents into the camp. People are dying, getting bitten by these serpents. But if you got bitten by the serpent, and you looked up at this brazen serpent that Moses made, you would be healed. You would live. So that's a picture, like Jesus. Jesus uses this analogy in John 3. As, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Right? So here, the problem was not the making of the serpent. Brazen serpent. Obviously, Moses was commanded by God to make it. But what was the problem? Well, later on, we see the nation of Israel in 2 Kings 18... This is where one of the kings is clearing up the place, right? Cleaning things up. He removed the high places, break the images, cut down the groves, break in pieces. Look at this. The brazen serpent that Moses had made. Why? For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it and he called it Nehushtan. So you see there they actually gave this brazen serpent that Moses had a name and they were worshipping and bowing down to it, treating it like a false god. So the problem was not the making of the brazen serpent. The problem was the worshipping and the serving of it. So you have, may have lucky charms and things like that. And you say, Victor, I don't have idols. I don't bow down to statues. Well, this one's for you. All right, Colossians 3.5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence. Look at this and covetousness, which is idolatry. You say, Victor, I wouldn't dare build a statue, bow down to it and worship it, but do you live for money? Is that the reason why you live? I know that's a big problem in Asian cultures. Hey, all they live for, prosperity, 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 make money, make sure you're comfortable, that's the reason for your life, that's what you're striving for. That's covetousness. Why is it idolatry? Because you're putting things above God. Right? So you say, I wouldn't dare bow down and worship something. That's sacrilegious. Well, if you treat money and you're covetous, that is idolatry according to the Bible. Putting things above God. So, be careful. Beware of, beware of covetousness. Right? Like Jesus says, for a man's life consisteth not of the things which he possesseth. So don't spend, you've got to be careful what you listen to. A lot of things on YouTube, it's all about covetousness. 
I don't know how many, I don't know how many ads I get where it's like, you know, make $22,000 a day, like I mean, from your laptop, and it's just some dropship thing or whatever. And how do they sell it to you? This covetousness. So beware of covetousness. Beware of the people you hang around. Don't spend too much time with people that are covetous. That's why covetousness is something that you don't want in church because it's infectious, right? They start telling you about all the great things in the world. You start wanting those things. You think like, yeah, it would be nice to have a nicer car and a nicer house and yeah, going all these things. It would be, it would be nice, wouldn't it? Hey, there's going to be plenty of time in heaven to do those things. Beware of covetousness. That's not what your life is about. Your life is about serving God. All right, witchcraft. Witchcraft. Deuteronomy 18. Oh, we'll skip over this one for sake of time, but this is just uh, some other things to do with witchcraft, but I'll show you here in Exodus 22. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. What is witchcraft? It's those who use familiar spirits. So familiar spirits are just demonic angels, right? They're the, the naughty angels that are going around serving Satan, and they're the ones when you, people talk about possession and doing all these supernatural things with demonic possession. These are these familiar spirits that are giving people these powers. Some people, they know that they're familiar spirits, and they get into that. They get into the occult. It's a bit like a drug, like a spiritual drug where people get curious. But beware of this, because when you get in, it's not so easy to get out when you know more a bit about it. It's probably best not to know too much about it. But we see here, this is what witchcraft is. And I think it's pretty obvious that God doesn't want us to have anything to do with witchcraft and sorcery and wizardry and all that sort of stuff in terms of actually doing it ourselves, right, and getting into it and, and dealing with these familiar spirits, right? We're not just talking about doing supernatural things. We're talking about dealing in the demonic realm and with these demonic spirits and we see here in the bible that it's such a, it's a serious thing that um, it was the cap, it was capital punishment and one of the more famous stories in the bible was when saul went to the witch in endor verse 7 in samuel first samuel 28 then said saul unto his servants seek me a woman that had the familiar spirit that i may go to her and inquire of her and a servant said to him behold there is a woman that had the familiar spirit at endor so this is why the witch at Endor is uh, quite a familiar phrase if you've heard of the witch at Endor. This is this story. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment and he went and two men with him and they came to the woman by night and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirits. We're not just talking about people having supernatural power and everything and the fantasy of being able to fly and all that sort of stuff. We're talking about people tapping in to familiar spirits, these evil, you know, demon possession and all that sort of stuff, and being able to do things. Divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me up whom I shall name unto thee. So this is the story where he went to the witch to conjure up Samuel the prophet, and then he was able to have an interaction with Samuel the prophet. So does these things, do these things exist in the world? They do. Should we be messing with it? No. You know, like Steve Irwin says about quarantine, you know, don't muck with it. Just like, leave it alone. But some people, even as Christians, still muck with this stuff. They go, they go along to tarot readers and palm readers and fortune tellers. They start believing that gemstones have certain powers and whatnot. This is where believers and Christians... Start, I, I talked about it a bit with lucky charms and all that sort of stuff. This is where believers start getting in to this sort of witchcraft stuff and sorcery that they ought not be dealing with. So, you know, superstition, gemstones, lucky charms, mediums. You know, going to a medium because you think you want to be able to talk with your dead loved one. I mean, is that possible? It's possible. But is it something you want to mess with? No. And it's something that God doesn't want us having anything to do with, Right? Because you may be biting off more than you can chew. You know, you don't want to use that situation in 1st Samuel 28 to justify you wanting to have a talk to somebody because you may not get that encounter. And you may just be channeling and putting yourself in a situation where you are dealing with spirits that you do not want to deal with. All right, hatred. 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 Hatred, to be specific, is hatred of your brother in Christ. Right? Hatred of people you ought to love. But hate is not a sin. I don't know if you know this. It's not wrong to hate. Right? 
there are times when we ought to hate, right? And there's a time to love. When the Bible talks about hatred, it's talking about hating people that you ought to love, right? Hating your brothers and sisters in Christ. Hate, you know, loving your enemies, right? But then there are people that we ought to hate. There are people that God hates. Psalm 11, the Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, look at this, his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. You know, a misconception people have about hatred is they think, first of all, they think hate, hate, all hating is a sin. They think it's wrong to hate things, which is not true. They also think that God loves everybody, which is not true. It's unfortunate, but it's, you know, it's not true. Well, it's not unfortunate because God's doing it, but I'm saying it's a misconception that God loves everybody. If God loved everybody, do you think there would be people burning in hell right now as we speak? That's God's wrath and hatred and his indignation. Right? The only way people can flee from God's hatred and his wrath is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. See, God loved everyone in the sense that he offered the grace of God to everyone. But to those that reject it, they, they are abiding under God's wrath. So not only, you know, there is a right way to hate, right? But, you know, that's not saying we shouldn't be characterized by hate, just like God is not characterized by hate. He's characterized by love. But if we truly love things, there will be things that we hate. I mean, if we love people, we love children, wouldn't we hate abortion? You know, it's like we love freedom, don't we hate oppression? Things like that. If we're going to love something, we're going to hate the other. If we love good, aren't we going to hate that which is evil? Psalm 139, look at what David said. I mean, remember we talked about songs, we talked about singing to the Lord? Don't forget, this is a psalm. This is, this is expected for them to sing. I mean, can you imagine singing this? I mean, we don't have any songs like this, but it just shows you that this, this is part of God's word. This is part of the songs that were there when David wrote this psalm. He says, Psalm 139, 21, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And I am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee. I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Uh, people often wonder, how does this work with loving your enemies, like the Bible talks about? And the way I tend to understand it, I've talked about this with a few people, is sometimes people do you wrong, right? Maybe they steal from you, they hurt you, they do things to you wrong personally. And you're meant to love those people, right? They don't, like Jesus prayed for the people, they know not what they do. But sometimes God has enemies, right? And we're talking about the people, you know, you know them. People, they just hate God. Everything they do, they don't want anything to do with God. They're on a crusade to just talk down the things of God and all that sort of stuff. These people we should have a strong disliking to, right? Do you know what I mean? So this is why God has enemies. And, you know, we should ought not love the people that hate God. And there are certain people that would be, that would fit that category, right? So it's not that you have to love everyone you know so there are people that we ought to hate and even david says here i hate them with perfect hatred so he said there is a right way to hate them but we should love our brothers and sisters in christ how do we love our brothers and sisters in christ we know that sometimes we're gonna conflict and that can sometimes lead to bitterness and anger and hatred towards our brother how do we overcome this well ephesians 4 tells us let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So how do you find it in yourself to not hate somebody, to, to, to forgive them, to you know, love them? Well, you need to be reminded about how God loved you. You, know, you spat in God's face, you continue to sin in God's eyes every day, and yet God loves you. God extends you grace. God loves you. God blesses you. And when you realize you are not deserving of God's love, you ought to show that love to other people. They may not deserve your love, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't love them because it's the right thing to do. It's what God wants us to do. Variance. Variance is when you cause division. Right? Variance is when you cause division. Now, it's not always wrong like we saw last time when we talked about Jesus being angry, talked about peace, it's not always wrong to cause division, right? But we're talking about causing division where division ought not to be caused, right? In, this, in certain places, verse 34. 
Jesus says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. So you see here that sometimes for the right reasons, there is a reason to cause division. But in some places, like in a church, it's not a good thing to cause division, right? And sometimes when people cannot get along, it's too much division when it comes to you. It's an irreconcilable division, right? Where you cannot see eye to eye. It's better sometimes to separate, right? It's better sometimes to separate. But you can see here, causing division is a big problem. And sometimes people don't always know they're causing division when there is contention. I don't know if you've ever... For those of us who know people who have had marriages break down, sometimes you see that happen in that situation where any sort of relationship breaks down. And what tends to happen? They start campaigning to get people on their side. Right? And it's very hard to deal with people that are, have problems with one another right? because they're trying to force people to take a side. That happens in churches for, for many different reasons. Right? That happens in all sorts of organisations, all sorts of groups. That's why conflict is a very destructive force in any group, right? Because once two people have a conflict within that whole group, it's now just uncomfortable for everyone. It's like a schism in the body. And this is why people that cause division in a body are told to be taken out of the body. Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offences contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Why? Because it's the simple people that tend to sway, oh, you know, and start taking sides. It's the wise that realize, hey, there's two sides to the story. You know, really, you guys should be working things out and we shouldn't be flaming the, fans of, uh, the, the flames, fanning the flames of contention anymore. Right? So division. Division, right? It's not right sometimes to stay somewhere and just cause problems. Sometimes it's better to separate, right? And that goes for anywhere in life, not just in church. Emulations. Emulations. So you might have an idea of what emulations are. Think about an emulator, emulating somebody. It's copying or being something that you're not. That's what emulations are. But just like with some of these other ones, where we talked about hatred, we talked about emulations, we talked about some other things here in uh, these works of the flesh, we need to be clear on good emulation and bad emulation. Right? You don't want to be caught up sometimes thinking, oh, you know, you just want to be genuine, always just say what you're thinking, be who you are, don't let anyone change you, that sort of thing. Because that's not the truth either. You know, all of us, to some extent... Uh, put, on a, put on a front, right? I'm sure when you go to your workplace, you know, go for a job interview, you don't just, you know, just tell them everything, just don't be yourself, right? You're trying, to, you're trying to lift your game, right? So there is good emulation where you're trying to emulate good behavior. But when we talk about emulation is you don't want to be two-faced. You want to be fake. You know, you don't want to be like, oh, I come to church and I'm all clean and how are you doing, brother? And then six days of the week, you're just worldly. Don't care about the things of God. You're fake in that instance, right? Because it doesn't actually match, you know, your heart, right? So it's a, it's a heart matter than it is just about trying to, you know, be, present yourself better. Because all of us do that to a certain extent, right? You, you're dating, for example, you put your best foot forward. You know, you try and go for a job interview or a business deal or whatever, you put, you're putting your best foot forward. But that's you trying to, you know, do what's right, not being fake, right? Not being nice to somebody and then you're like you're saying bad stuff behind their back. That sort of thing, right? So emulations is about, you know, copying somebody or being somebody more than you are or less than you are, right? But emulations can be a good thing. Because look at here how the word is used in Romans 11. This is Paul talking about trying to provoke his Israelite brethren, right? He says, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. So you see how like, when we're trying to be a good example, we want people to try and follow our example, we're trying to get them to copy us, right? But emulations is when sometimes you're being somebody to, for the wrong heart reason. You know, you may have a wrong motive, 
You may be too two faced, or you may be a fake, right? Where you're trying to make everyone think you're super spiritual, but in real life, you're not, right? That's the sort of emulation we want to get away from. Wrath. Now, we talked about this one briefly last week when we talked about anger. Just touch on this one quickly. But anger is not always a sin, too. Remember Ephesians 4 be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So how can we apply this? What's one way you can think about anger and, and, and a good gauge to know whether you have right anger or wrong anger? Well, one way you can gauge whether you are being righteously angry or not, besides the actual subject matter, is the speed at which you get angry. Sometimes people, if they've if they, they got a really bad temper, they fly off, they get angry very quickly. That's the sort of anger that can be bad anger. Right? Why? Because in James 1, look at what it says here. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. So you see, like, righteous anger is never anger that happens quickly. Something just happens and you just fly off the handle. You can't say I was being righteously angry because the Bible's telling you here, you need to figure out what's going on. Slow to speak, slow to wrath. Right, so never, never should there be a time where you just get angry really quickly. Right, people even say, even with Jesus, you know, when he looked at the uh, looked into the temple, you remember they were selling things in there. A lot of people will say, remember how he made a whip? So you see, how, like he didn't just see it and just flip. You know, he went away, made a whip, he came back angry. <laughs> right, verse twenty: For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Ain't that the truth? You know, when you get angry too quickly, that's when you tend to add even more sin to the sin you've done already, right? So it's not necessarily wrong to be angry. There's a right time for anger, but we should be slow to wrath, right? If you're getting angry quickly, that's probably the wrong type of anger. Just keep that in mind. All right, strife. So this is a bit like, you know, before we talked about, you know, contention. <clears throat> we talked about people being divisive and variant. So strife is just causing problems. Right? I just want to show you one proverb in regards to strife. Proverb 18, 19. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. And their contentions are like the bars of a castle. So what this proverb is saying here, once you offend somebody, it's something very hard to win them back. So there's two things I want you to think about when it comes to strife and contention. One is, you know, I, well, three things. One is I know it's sometimes not always possible to, to not offend people, right? So you, you try, but what I want you to think about, which is my first point, is we are trying our best not to cause strife. You know, we should go about our, our day and go about our things to try and not cause trouble, not try, not to try, try not to upset people. That's why even when we speak the truth, we speak the truth in love, right? Because some, when, some, when somebody is offended, it's very hard to win back. And, you know, we need to keep that in mind in anything we do in life, whether it's relationships in church, relationships at work, even out soul winning, right? If we burn somebody and we're rude to them, you know, that's, that's, another, that's another chance that they may not listen to the gospel the next time. We don't want to do that. Now, the other side of the coin to strife is try and be a person that's not so easily offended. Right, because everyone has to you know, go around. There's always two sides to the equation, right? Yeah, sure, we don't want to offend people, but we don't want to just become a nation of people that are just tiptoeing around everyone because they get offended at everything. Do you know what I mean? So there's two sides of this coin. Like, if you don't want strife, you say, well, this person's very offended. What can you do about it? Because everyone always wants the other person to stop offending them. Well, one thing you can do about it is not to be a person that's so easily offended. Why get offended? Why take it personally? They've got the problem. Do you know what I mean? If they're a problem person with strife and whatnot, that doesn't change who you are. Right? That's their, that can be their problem. So if you think about it that way, that will be a lot easier to deal with strife. Right? Don't get so easily offended yourself. Because why? That's something you can control. You can control whether or not you are somebody that causes strife, and you can control whether or not you get offended. But you can't control somebody else whether or not they're offended. So focus on the things you can control and don't focus on the things you can't control. All right, seditions. Seditions is probably something you guys probably don't do. <laughs> but seditions, 
Uh, I'll show you Ezra 4. And I commanded, and search hath been made, and it is found that this city of old time hath made insurrection against kings, and that rebellion and sedition have been made therein. So what is sedition? Sedition is like when you plan a rebellion, like a coup or like a, like a mutiny, right? That sort of thing. So it's like going against lawful authority, right? When I say lawful authority, I'm talking about authority that is there that God expects you to obey, right? But sometimes people are seditious in the sense that they create an insurrection and they try and overthrow the authority that is lawfully there. That's what sedition is. So that can happen in areas of life. That happens in churches as well. You know, sometimes, you know, our church is not democratic, but in some democratic churches you have leaders and people, you know, sort of plan to overthrow with bad intentions and things like that. All right, so that's what seditions is. All right, let's keep going. I've got a few more. I'm trying to go through them just quickly because I just want to teach you a bit about a few of them. All right, heresies. Heresies. Heresies is false doctrine. False doctrine. And now there is a distinction in the Bible between heresies and damnable heresies. Second Peter 2, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily, privily means secretly, shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So heresy can just mean false doctrine just in general, but there are damnable heresies too. And these are heresies that if somebody believes, you know, or they, they, they will actually send people to hell. They won't get people saved. So it's like denying that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. Right? If, somebody, if you're trying to get somebody saved and yet they deny Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, that's a damnable heresy. That's something that, that will not get them saved. Right? But what I want to talk to you about here, notice, one thing I want to point out is notice that heresies are a work of the flesh. Right? So it's possible for saved people to believe the wrong things. So it doesn't always mean just because somebody believes a heresy that they're necessarily not saved. Right? It'll make you doubt their salvation. It'll make you think, is this person really saved? But is it possible for believers to get caught up in heretical teachings? It is possible, right? Because it depends who you're listening to. You know, if you're listening to a lot of stuff on the internet, you may take on some teachings that are heretical, but you don't actually realize it. Right? You believe it. You may be talking to people about it, but you need to be, make sure that you believe things that are true. So how do you overcome heresy? Well, it's obvious you need to study God's Word. 2 Peter 2, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. That's the only protection you have against false doctrine. You say like Victor, well, you know, I learned from you. You're not going to teach me false doctrine. Hey, don't have so much hope in me. I don't, want, I don't want your faith built on me. I want your faith built on the Word of God. Right? If you're just believing things because you learnt it from me, you better get in the Word, study it for yourself, and know. Because what happens if I'm wrong? What happens if I'm gone? Right? What happens, like, you know, you need to stand on your own two feet, right? And stand on the Word of God and, 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 and um, you know, have that foundation. That be your foundation. Not any man. Not me. Not anyone on the internet. Not, not your spouse. You know, not, any, not your friend. You know, you need to stand on Jesus Christ yourself. Right? So heresies, that's the thing that will protect you from heresies. You need to study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman they're not to be, not, need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Envyings, envyings. I just want to say a few things on envyings. Envy in the Bible is not the same as jealousy. Right? When we talk about envy, jealousy, when we use the word today, often people think it's envy. Right? So there's a difference between jealousy and envy. Jealousy is not a bad thing. Jealousy is a good thing. Exodus 34, verse 14. For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, look at this, whose name is jealous. How can, a, how can jealousy be a sin when God says, my name is jealous? Is a jealous God. Right? So what does it mean to be jealous? Je jealous is when you have a strong desire and protection for the things that are yours. This is why God is jealous. He, does, he hates idolatry. Right? Why is he jealous? Because he wants his people to worship him 
and it's a righteous thing that he has. It's a righteous characteristic of God for him to demand the worship from those who ought to worship him, right? It's like wanting love from your wife, right? Or wanting, knowing that your wife is yours, not wanting to share your wife or your husband with other people, right? Being jealous over your children, not wanting the government to have control over your children and having a righteous, like, indignation towards the government and they're trying to take your children away, right? That's a jealousy for what belongs to you. And it's the same, I guess, the same with freedom, right? The same with liberty. That's something we should fight for, something we should be jealous over. It's something we ought to have. It's something that God has given us, right? But envy, envy is wanting what belongs to others, right? And when we think about covetousness in the Ten Commandments, that's what it's talking about. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass. That's a donkey, all right? Nor anything that is thy neighbor's, right? So that's what envy is. So, you know, I know sometimes we get caught up just using our colloquial language, what we're used to, but really we should distinguish between jealousy and envy. Because how many people do you know think jealousy is a bad thing? Jealousy is a good thing. Jealousy is the name of God, but we don't want to be envious. All right, three more very quickly. Murders. Murders. Murder, murder is the killing of innocent life. And it's very good that you have that right definition. Why? Because not all killing is wrong. Not all killing is wrong. People think the Bible teaches all killing is wrong, and this is why you have like Christian pacifists that you know, people shouldn't be involved in wars and all that sort of stuff. And I'm not making a comment that every war is righteous, right? I'm just saying there, are, there is a time sometimes for war, especially for defense purposes. But not all killing is wrong. Look at what the Bible says here in Exodus 21. He that smiteth the man so that he die, that's murder, that's killing somebody innocent, shall be surely put to death. So is it murder to kill the person that committed murder? No, it's not murder, right? Because now he's guilty, right? He's not innocent. Now, this doesn't mean that we take matters into our own hands. If we take matters into our own hands, I'll show you a verse in a moment. That is murder, right? Like if you think, oh, I'm going to execute justice and I'm going to go kill the person that murdered my child, that, that is murder, right? But when the government, through the court system and through capital punishment and execut execution of righteous judgment, kill somebody. That's not murder. Capital punishment is something that should happen in a righteous society for some crimes. He that smiteth the man so that he die shall be put, surely, surely be put to death. So obviously there is a right way of killing and a wrong way of killing, right? Exodus 22, even here in self-defense, verse 22, 2. Exodus 22, verse 2. If a thief be found breaking up, and be smitten that he died, there shall no blood be shed for him. So you know the Bible says somebody breaks into your house, right, at night time, and you defend yourself, and you kill that person. That's not murder, right? They shouldn't be breaking into your house at night time where you're not sure what's going on. But verse 3, if the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. So some people believe these, this means different things, whether it's like breaking up in the daytime. Um, I think it sort of means that if you're able to restrain him and then, you know, you can hold him until the next day, you, you can't, you don't just have a right just to kill that person, right? You're like, well, you were breaking up in my house and just kill. But it's like, you know, if, if he'd be found breaking up, it's like, whoa, and there's like a tussle and you defend yourself. If you kill him, that's self-defense. Right? If you can restrain them and then it can be found that you just held them captive and then just executed them, obviously that is murder. Right? So that's what it's talking about at the end there. Ex uh, Ecclesiastes 3.8. A time to love. Remember we talked about hatred before? And a time to hate. See, he says a time to love, it's time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Right? So a lot of the wars we hear about these days is just... America going in and just getting oil or whatever, you know what I mean? There's this stuff going on. And um, a lot of the wars that are supposedly fought for freedom are just like, you know, serving the interests of banks and all sorts of stuff. 
I'm not talking about those wars. I'm talking about there is a time for war where if your country is under attack and you take up arms and you defend your country, there is a time sometimes to fight, right? And, and it's not to just be merciful and like, this guy's coming at me with a gun, but you know, I'm a Christian, I can't kill and things like that. No, there's a, there's a time for war. You know, when you're defending your family, sometimes you're defending your country. There's a time for war. There's a time of peace. And I, the last verse I just want to show you here on, on um, this passage on, on murders is here. It says, If men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. So notice here that if men are fighting and a woman's involved and she loses her child, right? That's not a, a murder, right? That's not a, a, something punishable by death because the men were fighting and you know when men fight, sometimes women get involved and they're like, no, no, don't hit me or whatever. And if they accidentally get hit or whatever, they fall down something and they lose their baby. The Bible's saying here, hey, look, you're going you're gonna to be fine, right, to pay the woman's husband. Uh, will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. So you're going to pay some restitution to the family that lost the child in that instance. But look at what it says here. It says, it says here, this passage here, yet if no mischief follow. So what is this? Verse 23, if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. This law here is a discouragement for people taking the law into their own hands, right? It's like you get into a fight, you lose the baby, you go and get revenge. The Bible says here, if you do that, then whatever you did to that person will be done to you. If you kill them, you're going to be killed. If you, so this is where this balancing of the scales is. This is you taking matters into your own hands. This is not something God wants us to do. If you want to take matters into your own hands, you go to the, through the court system. That's the right way to go about it and go through the lawful process. Drunkenness. Drunkenness is the excess consumption of alcohol. Right? It's not simply the consumption of any alcohol. I don't believe just drinking any alcohol is a sin. It's the excess consumption. Ephesians 5.18 And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Right? So if you are someone that lacks self-control, it's better to abstain from alcohol altogether. Right? That's what the Bible says tells us, right? The Bible talks about it. Sometimes it's better if you can't control yourself just to not do it at all, right? But, and sometimes people take this sin lightly. You know, it's so normal in our society these days, go out for a few drinks, you know, you get smashed off your face or whatever. You know, there's a difference between loosening up a little and just getting plastered, right? And if you're somebody that gets drunk all the time, that's, that's not welcome at our church. You know, we, we, we talk about different sins that are not welcome at church. It's out, outlined in 1 Corinthians 5. These are not the only ones. But people take drunkenness lightly. But I don't take it lightly, you know, because uh, the Bible does not take it lightly. 1 Corinthians 5. But now I've written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous, that's the one we talked about before. We saw this one in the works of the flesh idolater, we saw that one, a railer, right? So this often leads to variance and strife. This is false accusations. Or a drunkard, or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. So we see here certain sins that are not welcome in the body of Christ. And the less I have to deal with these, the better, guys. So please, take these out of your life. <laughs> All right, last one, revelings. I won't spend too much time here. But we saw 1 Peter 4. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have brought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Right, so what is revelings? How is this revelings different to lasciviousness? So lasciviousness is just the unrestrained indulgence in the lusts of the flesh. Revelings is related to banquetings, but revelings is like loud partying. You know, and you may be the type to do this um, it was a big problem in Mexico. Uh, you know, we were in Mexico, just people always having these loud, riotous parties, playing their obscene music. We had a neighbor literally like across the road, like every night, just like blasting their music. And it's just like blasting straight into our 
thing. And it's just like this in consideration, right? But also just the, the living for like this lust and pleasure and just partying up all the time. That's what revelings is. So it's kind of related to lasciviousness. Okay? So not much to say about that. So again, Galatians 5. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So I hope as we went through those, just reflect on your own life. Are you seeing these characteristics in your life? And what can you do to see less of these works of the flesh in your life? And don't be shocked when Christians do these. Don't get caught up in work salvation and all that sort of thing when people think, well, how can you do these if you're a Christian? Because you know what? If you start saying things like that about others, before long, you're going to be doubting your own salvation. You know, that's the danger of work salvation. Is when you start applying work salvation to others, before long, you know, they say, you point one finger, three fingers pointing back. If you're consistent with that standard, soon you're going to be doubting your own salvation. So when you think about these sins, don't doubt your own salvation, right? Just notice them in your life, repent from them, get right with God, and let's have more fruit of the Spirit in our life rather than the works of the flesh. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, Lord, thank you that uh, you know, we can get rebuked from your word, Lord, that we can reflect on the sins we shouldn't have in our life. So I pray, Lord, that you just use our life to serve you, help us to walk in the flesh more, and I pray, Lord, that our life will be characterized by the fruit of the Spirit and not by the works of the flesh. Lord, help us. It's not easy to do. So we just pray, Lord, that you would help us to walk right, and uh, Lord, help us to cut these sins out of our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.